All right, let's move on to the first question of this passage. It says, what is the number of neutrons in the nucleus of the atom used to produce laser radiations? So let's go back to the passage, see what we're using. We're using this ion here. Um, this is a specific isotope form of krypton. It's an ion. Um, so let's, let's just make a note of that here. We have 86 Kr plus. All right, so this you know, charge comes from the difference in protons and electrons, um, but we don't. it doesn't tell us anything about the number of neutrons. So we don't have to really worry about the charge of the krypton here. We do have to worry about this number here, 86. Um, this tells us the um, mass, basically. It's giving us the mass number of this krypton ion. And from this, we can actually calculate the number of neutrons. So let's look at the periodic table. Remember, this is given to you on the exam. Krypton um, is element number 36, which means it has 36 protons. And the mass number is equal to number of protons plus the number of electrons. It's, or sorry, pro, number of protons plus number of neutrons. It's really that simple. So if we have 86 neutrons, or 86 as our mass number, that's equal to 36 protons plus X number of neutrons. Solving for X, we know that's gonna be 50. So we know this has to have 50 neutrons. Um, hopefully this is a pretty straightforward explanation for this question. Um, this is a very fundamental question, so make sure you guys have these concepts that I've just talked about here um, very well locked in your mind. Because what is the molecular formula of the heterocyclic aromatic compound pyrrole? Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, this is just kind of like a discrete, you just have to know what the structure of pyrrole is, like I've said before. Looks like these exams are gonna be asking you uh, more about the structure. Um, so if you know the structure of here, this is a very relatively simple way to go about this. And here we go, this is the structure of pyrrole. Let's count the number of carbons, one, two, three, four. We have four carbons, count the number of nitrogens, one. Count the number of hydrogens, remember each of these double bonds has a hydrogen attached to it, or carbons with a double bond have a hydrogen attached to it, so that's one, two, three, four, five. That's five hydrogens, so we're just looking for something with four carbons, one nitrogen, five hydrogens, and that's gonna point us to B. Another clue to make sure, you know, maybe you had a vague idea of what the structure of pyrrole was, um, you drew something similar to this, um, another way you kind of check your answer is by looking at this structure here, because we know this is a tetrapyrrole. And so there should be, you know, if you divide this up into four different groups, we'll see that we do have four different pyrrole molecules. Um, it's just a little bit tricky because there has to be an extra carbon that links these four um, pyrroles together. So maybe that could trip you up. Maybe you'll think that there's, you know, maybe five carbons instead of four in a pyrrole molecule. Um, but, you know, hopefully, the like, like I said, the best way to to this question to just know exactly what the structure of pyrrole is. So pyrrole, um, imatazole, um, some of the biochemical structures, there are a few handful of structures that you do need to just know for the MCAT because it is very much fair game these days. All right, guys, this is the next question of this passage. It says approximately how many moles of this krypton are contained in the laser tube at zero degrees Celsius and one ATM? Zero degrees Celsius and one ATM, what does that tell us? This is standard temperature and pressure. So this actually gives us a pretty big clue. Um, and there's one number that you should know for this, this problem. And it's that at standard temperature at STP, um, one mole of some kind of gas will occupy roughly 22.4 liters. Okay, well, let's look at, so we know that, we, if we know this relationship, um, we can actually figure out the, the answer to this problem. How is that? Well, we know that the volume that this gas is, um, occupying is actually 11 cubic centimeters, uh, it tells us in the passage. So then we know that it must be X moles of gas occupies 11 cubic centimeters. And so we just need to find out what this X is. Now, keep in mind, note that this relationship only translates to this relationship because we know that we're at standard temperature and pressure. Um, so this is a very handy dandy uh, shortcut that you should keep in mind for the MCAT. It will save you a lot of time. So again, one mole of gas at STP is 22.4 liters. Um, or will occupy 22.4 liters. Therefore, we can translate this relationship to X moles of gas, then we'll occupy 11 cubic centimeters. So 22.4 liters, how many cubic centimeters is that? One other relationship you should know that is one cubic centimeter is one milliliter, okay? And we know that there's 1,000 milliliters in one liter, correct? So what this tells us is 22.4 liters is equal to 22.4 times 1,000 milliliters, which is equal to 22.4 times 10 to the three cubic centimeters. So we have a relationship here. So one mole of gas occupies 22.4 times 10 to the 23 cubic centimeters. How do we solve for X? So X over 11 
So x moles over 11 cubic centimeters is equal to 1 mole over 22.4 oops times 10 to the 3 cubic centimeters. Let's multiply both sides by 11 cubic centimeters. So times 11 cubic centimeters and times 11 cubic centimeters. We know this goes away. Um, looks like the cubic centimeters will also go away. So x is equal to 11 divided by 22.4 times 10 to the 3. Well, 11 divided by 22.4, that's essentially 1 half, correct? So we have 1 over 2. Um, we can roughly estimate that to 1 half times 10 to the third, that's equal to 0 0.5 times 10 to the negative three. So that's the number of moles that we have. So 0 0.5 times 10 to the negative three, another way of saying that is in scientific notation, five times 10 to the negative four. Wow, my fours are all over the place today. There we go. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Um, it was just, as soon as we knew this relationship, we just set up a ratio, x, is equal to, we just multiply each side by 11, um, and we know that x then has to be 5 times 10 to the negative 4, that's d. Next question of the passage, and it says, the radiation of wavelength 605 cannot be used to produce the fluorescence radiation depicted in figure 3 because. And let's just briefly overview fluorescence here. Um, oh, I guess I have some calculations down here that I forgot to delete earlier. Well, let's look at fluorescence. Okay, let's say I have some molecule, okay, and I want this, this to fluoresce. The way fluorescence works in the most basic terms is you're going to be inputting energy in the form of light. And what happens is electrons get excited, and then as they fall back down to their original position, it's going to emit energy. And that emission energy is what we see. This is the fluorescence that we see. So in simple terms, you input energy through light, and then it's going to emit um, some energy as fluorescence, as light as well. Now what you do have to keep in mind here is the in energy that you input has to be greater than the energy that's going to be emitted out. So this energy here, energy input, has to be greater than energy output. Um, and that kind of makes sense. Imagine you only put a little bit of energy into this molecule and you get more energy out, then that would probably defy a lot of rules in physics. And that would also mean we have some infinite energy system. So in keeping accordance with all of the laws that we know, um, the energy that we input has to be greater than the energy of the output. Um, that we see in the light, at least. What that tells us, then, is that, well, if we know that energy is equal to, well, it's proportional to wavelength, or the inverse of uh, frequency, sorry, and frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength, that means higher energy means lower wavelength. Um, therefore, if energy of the input has to be greater than the energy of output, the wavelength of the light that you're putting in as the input has to be less than the wavelength of the energy, um, or sorry, the wavelength of the light that's being output. Again, to reiterate this kind of logic, we know energy is directly proportional to frequency, and we know frequency is directly proportional to the inverse, or is inversely proportional, sorry, uh, to the, the wavelength. So what that means is that energy has to be proportional to the inverse, or it's inversely proportional to wavelength. In other words, if you want higher energy, you want a lower wavelength. And therefore, if the energy of the input light has to be greater than the energy of the output light, the wavelength of the input light has to be less than the wavelength of the output light, the fluorescent light. So let's take a look at 605. Now we'll notice some peaks here. Uh, most notably, we have 604 as one of the fluorescent peaks that we're looking at. Well, we'll notice 605 nanometers is actually greater than 604 nanometers. What does that mean? This fluorescent light, the light that we're seeing um, from these emission, one of those lights actually has higher energy than the light that we would be using with 605. So if you were to use 605 as our wavelength for the light that we're inputting as energy, and we somehow got 604 um, as the wavelength of the light of the fluorescence, well, this would be impossible, like I said, um, given that the energy of the output has to be less than the energy of the input or the, the wavelength of the output has to be greater than the wavelength of the input. The wavelength, so if we use 605, the wavelength of the fluorescent, the output, always has to be, the output has to be greater, or sorry, yeah, the output wavelength has to be greater than 605. So if we use 605, because 605 can only produce wavelengths, so if we input something that's only 605 into, and as energy, 
if we input something with a wavelength of 605 nanometers, the output uh, fluorescent light has to have a wavelength that's greater than 605. And given that we see 604, this would be an impossible state. Um, that's the reason why you can't use 605 nanometer light in this uh, radiation depicted in figure three. And so that answer is A, energy of the absorbed radiation must be greater than the energy of the fluorescent radiation. Um, B is just the direct opposite, which we know has to be wrong. Um, you know, C has to be wrong since, like I said, energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. So higher wavelength means lower energy. So 605 nanometer radiation have lower energy. And then the 605 nanometer radiation is not visible. That's not true. We know what the visible light spectrum is. Um, that's around 400 to 800 nanometers.